So just as atoms can have an electron removed, which requires energy called the ionization energy, most atoms can also acquire an electron, which releases energy. And this is called an atom's electron affinity. Now I'll give you an example that's just a general equation for electron affinity. So you take an atom, you add an electron, and what you end up with is a negative ion and energy. And this energy is always expressed as negative energy because by convention energy is measured as energy put into the system. So if you add an electron to an atom and it releases energy, that is the opposite of putting energy in, hence the negative sign, which means this energy is opposite putting energy in. So now if we look at electron affinity in the periodic table, if you'll remember from our last video that the noble gases are in the lowest possible energy state for that energy level. Now, what this means is that the group right next to them, the halogens, have the uh, largest electron affinity, but because it's negative, they have the least electron affinity. So this means that when they add another electron, they form what's known as a stable octet. They fill their outer energy level, which causes them to be in the lowest energy possible, meaning that they go from a state of very high energy to very low energy relatively quick, quickly, which is why they have the most negative electron affinity. That is, they release the most energy out of any of the groups of elements. Now, as a general rule, electron affinity gets more and more negative as you go across a period, eventually culminating with, as I mentioned, the halogens being the having the uh, most negative electron affinity. However, when you go from group 6 to group 7, you'll notice that group 6 has a much larger electron affinity than group 7. And this is because in group 6, the carbon group, what you're doing is you're filling up the final uh, sublevel within the p orbital with one electron. Now when you go to the seventh when you go to the nitrogen group, what you have to do is you go from carbon's uh, configuration and then you add the electron into a sublevel that's already occupied. And this requires a much larger energy input which detracts from the energy released by this electron affinity to form the uh, negative ion. And as you go down groups, it gets harder and harder to add an electron because they are farther or farther away from the nucleus. So the effect of nuclear charge they feel is much higher up here where the electron cloud is much smaller. So they're closer to the nucleus in the middle. However, when you get down here, the nuclear charge they feel is a lot smaller because they're much farther from the nucleus. They're way out there. Plus, within that area, there's a bunch of negative charge from the other electrons in the energy levels below it. So what you'll find is that as you get lower down a group, uh, they release less and less energy as you add electrons to form ions. So much like the second and third ionization energies, the second and third electron affinities aren't as convenient as the first one. So what you'll find is that the second electron affinity, that is when you take a negative ion, let's say F minus, and you try to add another electron to it, it actually, instead of releasing energy and having a negative electron affinity, it requires energy because this no longer has a neutral charge. Instead, it has a negative charge. So this electron will repel that negative charge. So it requires positive energy to add electrons for the second or third, etc., uh, electron affinities. So now we're going to be covering ionic radius. And if you'll remember from earlier, an ion is just an atom with a charge, so either positive or negative. And now these each have a name. For example, the positive 
positive ions are called cations, which is easy to remember because the T in cation looks like a positive sign, and then the negative is called an anion, and that is easy to remember because it's not the cation. Now the radius of cations is going to be smaller than that of the normal atom because they have fewer electrons and a greater effective nuclear charge on the outer electrons since there are fewer electrons in the middle sort of shielding them with negative repulsion. Now the anions oppositely are going to be larger than a neutral atom because they have more electrons in the electron cloud, meaning that they have to spread farther and farther away from the nucleus. Now if we go down and look at our table, uh, what you'll find is that these metals over here will tend to form cations because they have a uh, very low electron affinity, which means they lose electrons very easily. And the nonmetals, which are over here, uh, will tend to form anions because they are very close to the stable noble gas formation over here on the far right. So what they want to do is add one more or two more, however many more electrons to get to that stable formation. And just like atomic radii, ionic radii will tend to form that snowman blowing bubble shape I was talking about earlier. That is, the radius will increase as you go down the group. However, it will decrease as you go across a period. Again, because of the effective nuclear charge is much smaller over here than it is over here. So now we'll be discussing valence electrons and the first thing you need to know is that chemical reactions, compounds, and molecules form by gaining, losing, or sharing electrons. It's not really about the protons or neutrons in the nucleus, it's all about the electrons in the cloud that sort of uh, engulf the nucleus. Now the electrons that are in the outermost energy level, that is if you have an element, say, lithium, which has the configuration 1s2, 2s1. The outermost energy level is the second energy level, and in this case there's only the one electron, which is in the s sublevel. These are called the valence electrons, and these are the ones that are involved in chemical reactions because they are the most susceptible to outside influence. Let me draw a quick lithium atom. Let's say you have the nucleus there, and then you have the first energy level and the second energy level. Now on the first energy level you have these two electrons, and on the second you have just the one. Now let's say a proton was passing by with its positive charge. This electron, which is on the outside, is much closer to the proton than these internal ones, and these sort of feel a repulsion from this electron as well. So what ends up happening is that only the electrons that are in this outer uh, energy level sort of feel the influence of this proton or a different atom or an ion or any sort of charged particle, which is why these in the outer energy level are the ones involved in reactions. And if you look at the periodic table, it's actually very easy to figure out how many valence electrons an element has based on uh, its group number. So I'm just going to go ahead and list the number of valence electrons for each group. And what you'll find is that, first of all, for the S block, it's just the group number. So for groups one and two, they have one and two valence electrons respectively. However, when you get over to the P block, they're thrown off on group number by this D block in here. So all you have to do is take the second digit of each group. For example, the boron group, which is group 13, happens to have three valence electrons. Or the carbon group, group 14, has four valence electrons, etc. And this is true all the way across. And what you'll notice when you look at chemical reactions is that uh, all atoms are sort of trying to get to this number eight over here, these eight valence electrons called the stable octet. And this is why the noble gases are so unreactive 
is because they already have this, so they don't need to give up or share or take on more electrons to get to this stable 8 valence electron configuration. So now we'll be discussing a property called electronegativity, and as you'll remember, uh, the valence electrons are the ones that hold compounds and molecules together. Now the problem with this is that because these electrons are being shared or given up, uh, what happens is that this can cause an uneven charge across two atoms, because if one atom has taken another atom's electron, this one will become slightly positive and this one will become slightly more negative due to the difference in charge. Now in order to measure how easily uh, an element will take an electron from another, chemists created a scale to measure how effectively an element can attract another electron. And this property of attraction, attracting uh, electrons from other elements is called electronegativity. So it's sort of an arbitrary measurement because they just do a scale from 0 to 4 and 4 is just given to fluorine which through experimentation they have determined to be the most electronegative element and then the electric the electronegativity rather of all the other elements is determined relative to fluorine so now if we go down the gr go down to the periodic table and look at how electronegativity t tends to uh, go across periods and groups what you'll find is that electronegativity is highest over here on the right and lowest over here on the left that is it tends to increase as you go across a period and it tends to either uh, go down or uh, remain about the same as you go down a group and this of course makes sense because as I mentioned before fluorine which they determined to be the most electronegative element uh, is assigned the arbitrary value of four and then all the rest of them in this vicinity, especially the halogens, those uh, gases and liquids and solids within fluorine's group, tend to be very electronegative as well. So all the elements around fluorine are very electronegative, and then the ones far away tend to be less than electronegative, which makes the uh, trends across the period and down the group very easy to remember. Now we work mostly with the main group elements, that is the S block and P block in this course, so I won't be covering the properties of D and F block elements as they relate to electronegativity, electron affinity, and all the other uh, properties in this section unless it's explicitly requested by you guys.